الحمد لله. Over these uh, past weeks, we've spoken a lot about uh, moving to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And in Arabic, this science, uh, one of the names of this science is saluk, which means uh, movement. It means wayfaring the art of traveling, how to travel, how to move, to know where you're moving to, to know how to move, so on and so forth. And what's inherent in, in that process is knowing where you're going to. But we've also spoken about the importance of uh, having a kind of fuel along the way. So in previous sessions we had a brief uh, encounter with muraqaba, uh, inter introspection, knowing what's going on inside, and uh, sometimes it can be scary. And uh, one of the the benefits of writing out a journal is when it's down on paper, it's very difficult for the nafs to then then make excuses. Um, so it's a process of gaining confidence to look in the mirror. And to know that you're only there because it's, it's, uh, it's Allah which is moving you upon a path to Him. It's not, it might, be, might not be the ni a nice uh, feeling at the beginning. But why do people look into a mirror? It's to adjust their appearance. So when we have this process of looking into the heart, it's really to adjust not only the appearance of the heart, but the, the very depths in the, of, of the being, state of being within, within, your, within your heart and what that means. We talked about all, some of those uh, components. Uh, and we're going to be going on to, in forthcoming weeks, uh, hone, uh, focusing on some of those particular things within the heart. But we need to like understand what we're looking at first and foremost. Now, tonight, um, I wanted to reflect a little on uh, intentions. So we're going to be talking about intentions. And an intention uh, has different meanings depending upon the particular in, the particular discipline which you're involving yourself in. They say in fiqh, a niya, qastu shay, qastu shay, wa mahallaha al qalb that the intention, the niya in the Arabic language, is this qast, which you could say is an aim. It's not the, aim, the end goal, it's not the aim, but it's, it's the aiming of something. The process of aiming towards something. The process of moving and orienting towards a goal, toward shay, anything. Because it could be good or bad, beautiful, ugly, foul, splendid. But the, it's this process of, of inc inclination. And this is why the scholars of the science will often talk about mail and qalb, the inclination of the heart. We spoke about in previous weeks the, the nature of the heart and why it's called the qalb, because of its the kathra taqallubi, because it's constantly revolving, constantly rotating, constantly uh, you know, maneuvering. And it's how to place it into a state of uh, movement in the right direction, so you're heading in the right direction. So it's, t it's the art of aiming for something, it's the process rather of aiming for something. And then they say, وَمَحَلَّهَا الْقَلْبِ that It's mahal, it's place in which it resides, it's locus, it's reciprocal um, space where it's contained or cradled is the heart. So the intent is interesting because the, the intention is not formulated ultimately in the mind. Or that the aql, or the, the mind, can help you be, be creative with intentions. But its ultimate place is in the heart. And this is why we can understand that you can pretend to be on a particular agenda, but Allah ultimately uh, looks to your heart, which is the place where your real intention lies. And that's one of the most important reasons why we need to be attentive to that. إن الله لا ينظر إلى صوركم ولا إلى أجسادكم ولكن ينظر إلى قلوبكم وأعمالكم. Allah doesn't look to your image, 
it doesn't look to how you necessarily project yourselves. You could say suwar, the suwar, the, the, the form, the superficiality. What does it mean? It, it means that Allah is not interested in how you project yourself, how you camouflage, how you front. وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ Rather, He looks to your hearts. And what does that mean? It's the spiritual heart, it's the metaphysical heart, it's the place where intentions reside, because that's what is ultimately of worth and meaning to Allah. The Prophet وسلم, uh, taught us the importance of intentions uh, in the hadith narrated by Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, the well-known hadith, in al a'malu bin niyat wa inna ma nikullimir in ma nawa. It's difficult to translate, you can approximate it, it probably needs a bit more unpacking to fully understand the hadith. Innama harf hasar. It's it's a it's a particle in the Arabic language which which is uh, negating. So when you say innama, intentions are only or, or rather actions and that which you do is only founded or valid in accordance to their intention. Nothing else, meaning there is no meaning to anything that you do, anything that you say, any act you perform, except in accordance to what it's connected back to, the state of the heart, your agenda, what was your motive behind doing this. And this is why this science is so important for dealing with uh, the weeds of hypocrisy entering into the soul, nifaq, which is where there's a dislodging where your outward a'mal, the things that you do, are no longer connected or rooting to something which is truly for the sake of Allah. And it becomes distracted through riya, for showing off through other people, to other people, uh, or a whole host of other diseases of the heart. May Allah protect us all from them. So actions are only founded or valid in accordance to their intentions. Imam al-Shafi'i, uh, and many others said that this was thuluth al This is a third of all knowledge, this one hadith. A third of all knowledge is to be contained within this hadith. And uh, some of the scholars mentioned that the reason for this is it's to do with your mind, your limbs, and your heart. So a third of it is the heart, and this is the intentions are to do with the state of your heart. And this is a statement of, of reality. Every person only gets that which they intended for. For every person, they only get that which they have intended. Be it good and healthy, or be it negative and, and uh, putrid. Somebody could, could disguise a, a good act uh, or rather disguise a, motive, disguise a motive with a good act. And it gets, uh, sometimes those things can be very stark and obvious, it's a very blatant uh, display of hypocrisy, or sometimes they can be subtle. You know. And obviously the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's a divine protection from shirk. Uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, said that uh, Indeed, the shaitan has given up AS, just despaired that people will worship other than Allah في جزيرة العرب in the, in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but, they, but what he does is he sows, sows seeds of discord amongst people. But the, what the Prophet ﷺ did fear for his ummah was a different type of shirk, a different type of associating partnership. And what that means is not necessarily a theological thing. If you ask most Muslims do they believe in one God, they'd say, of course. That's what makes you a Muslim. It's the foundational tenet of our faith, that Allah is one. But do we always act in accordance to that? Do we always act in a way which is befitting that we're ultimately created by Allah, we're from Allah, we go back to Allah, we're being monitored by Allah, Allah is completely aware of us. There's never a moment or an instant or an occasion where He's not aware of everything that we are. And do we act in accordance to that? And that's, you know, 
That's not an, no easy task. And this is why it's also called the science of ikhlas. Ikhlas is absolute sincerity. So it's this process of cultivating your heart, being creative with intentions so that you start to condition the heart to constantly navigate it back to Allah. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I saying what I'm saying? Why am I acting in this way? Why did I respond in that way? Why do I have that particular goal in life? Why do I want to buy that particular thing? Why did I look at that person in that way? Why did I look at that other person in another way? Why did I make that choice for what was for tea tonight? Why did I decide to come? Why did I decide to go? Why did I decide to be with that person and not with that person? It's everything that we do. And ultimately the science uh, of, or the discipline within the science of, tes uh, of uh, Tezkiyah is in refining the intention, is, is navigating the mundane, and that which is seemingly trivial, to that which has profundity and meaning. And that which has profundity and meaning is that which is connected back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of what we do during the day is pretty mundane, mundane stuff. And it can feel particularly in our context that we feel detached. You, know, you, want, to, you want to be uh, more devoted. Uh, you want to be a person that has more you know, to their name, if you like, before Allah. You feel that you know, you're not really doing much. You're not really doing much for your deen. There, there's so much focus on other things. So what we need to be really, we really need to take this seriously and understand that this, this gift which the Prophet ﷺ gave us of activating our intentions and understanding our intentions and how to, um, for the sake of language, let's say create them or really facilitate a space for them to cre be created within you to know how important that is for our spiritual um, well-being, particularly in the context which we're living in now. So to explain this further, there's no good intention necessarily for uh, praying the Maghrib prayer. You can make the intention to turn back to Allah, but it's more similar to a dua. Why? It's because it's a fart, it's an obligation, something you have to do, you know. And you can lose out in your sincerity, you know, if you turn, turn away from Allah or if you're doing it to show up, but that's not what we're talk, talking about here. You, your intention is, is, is a formal placement of an intention in order to enter into the prayer. However, there are things which are not an oblig a religious obligation and not within the realms of that which is mustahab or recommended to do, sunnah, marghub fi. And it's within the realms of mubah, ibaha. It's just neither here nor there. And the, the, the technical definition this is why it's so important to understand fiqh. And I think we really need to kind of, fiqh needs a bit of a, uh, a PR revamp because it's got this whole kind of thing, it's this dry thing that only like technical heads kind of get into and it's it's not it's 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 part of how to be it's, it's learning how to be and it's that that structure which is not a man-made structure very important to understand it's it's a structure which Allah has gifted to us and in embracing that we learn how to be how to act how to deal with things how to get married how to buy and sell you know, how to wash ourselves is so encompassing. And that which is mubah, مَا لَا يُثَابْ عَلَى فِعْلِهِ وَلَا يُعَقِبْ عَلَى تَرْكِهِ is that which is not, there's no reward in doing it. There's no you know, otherworldly reward from Allah in performing that act or doing that thing that has this, cat in the category of mubah, which is most stuff, 
most things are mubah. They're neither here nor there. And that's why the shaitan, if he can't get you in haram, he'll get you in the, this huge you know, realm of just wasting a lot of your time. So, وَمَا لَا يُعَاقِبْ عَلَى فِعْلِهِ And it's also, there's no retribution. There's no taking into account if you don't do it. So, the difference with, a, with a, a, something which is wajib in the deen is that which you are uh, rewarded for doing and there's, a, there's, a, there's an accountability and a punishment, iqab, for not doing. And that which is haram is the other end of the, the scales. That which you're rewarded for not doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. That which you're rewarded for actively not doing. Yeah? And if you do, there are implications, depending on whatever that may be. But you've got this huge realm of what's called mubah. And when we talk about our daily lives, the monotony of our daily lives, it's because we're engaged in that which is typically mubah, that which is neither here nor there. And going in the car to work is mubah. You're not going to get you know, palm trees and jannah for starting your, your engine in the morning. There's no hadith that relates to these kind of things. But you're also not going to get punished for doing it. There's no sin, if you like. It's not a zemb to get in your car on the way to work or school or college, whatever it may be. Going to the gym. Daily stuff. There's no inherent reward for working out. And you're not going to get punished if you miss out on the training opportunity on that particular day. Going to work in and of itself, if it's not combined with a righteous intention, is neither here nor there. Now obviously if somebody has uh, dependents, people that they're religiously obliged to take care of, then the hukum changes. Uh, so how do you transform that whole space into something of meaning? Imam al-Haddad uh, was a master of this science and he has an entire chapter in a manual which he wrote uh, titled Risal al Mu'awana, which is the book of assistance. And he talks about this in depth, and I thought it'd be worthwhile taking some blessing from this book, inshallah, just reading through, and we can go through and, and reflect upon this meaning. So he says, and I'm going to paraphrase because there's quite a few pages here, uh, just to get some of the, uh, the main uh, sentiments within each paragraph. وَعَلَيْكَ يَا أَخِي بِإِصْلَاحِ النِّيَّةِ وَإِخْلَاصِهَا وتفقدها والتفكر فيها قبل الدخول في العمل فإنها أساس العمل والأعمال تابعة لها تابعة لما حسنا أو قبحا أو صحة أو فسادا And then he says something really interesting. He says, وَيَشْتَرَتْ لِسِدِقِ النِّيَّةِ أَنْ لَا يُكَذِبَهَا الْعَمَلِ So one of the signs of a sincere intention is that your act does not deny it. And he gives examples of somebody that says, you know, if I had some money, if I was wealthy, that I would give, give to the poor, get some kind of like wealth, gets a bonus at his work. And then he's kind of like, mm, well, you know, there's many other things and Allah provides for the poor. It's not me, I'm not the one that gives the rizq, Allah will provide for people. Now, basically it's the way of the nafs of getting out of having to give the money, you know. But what Imam al-Haddad is saying is that is indicative that your intention was not sound in the first place. Not sound, meaning not accepted to Allah. Were it to be accepted, that which you do would coincide with it. So back to this concept of transforming the mundane, 
really important uh, component of our, of our saluk, of our movement to Allah. How do you do this? Well, the niya, they say it's like an, an alexia, iksir in the Arabic language, which is in, in, in alchemy, it's transforming a base metal like lead into gold. It's rendering something of no value through the means of a catalyst into that which is of value. So the mubah to Allah is of no value, it's of no worth. It's not something which Allah is, it's, no, it doesn't, it's not, not indicative of something moving to Allah. You're just plateauing. There's no exertion. And Allah likes to see that within people. So how do you do that? You coincide a righteous intention with that which is mubah. So for example, given the examples we gave before, going through one's daily routine, people typically, many people, they, they get up in the morning and they go to work. So in that space of time, there's a huge amount of prep time. But people are busy with podcasts, people are busy with the radio, people are busy with, I don't know, whatever they're busy with. But to, there's a difference between that person, which, you know, at the end of the day may be mubah. And somebody that's actually saying, no, this is actually a time for me to get close to Allah. This is a time which has been given to me. And we're not necessarily saying if you've got to go like half an hour or an hour to work, you've got to fill that whole space. Five minutes. Just that point of tawajjuh, of that inner, inward orientation. Why am I doing what I'm doing right now? And one of the examples of this, for example, is I'm traveling on my way to work now. And you can add, there are, different, there are intentions which you can infuse into the actual thing, the actual act. And then there are kind of like branched, branch, uh, intentions which branch off. So an example of the intention which is infused into the act is basically s telling yourself why you're doing what you're doing. What's the agenda behind what you're doing? You're going to... Uh, to provide for one's family, if you have to earn a living, that if you have surplus wealth, which doesn't go to your dependents, that you're able to give in charity. And then you have branched of intentions, things like, if you see somebody that's in need of help along the way, that you're going to stop and you're going to help them. That, if, if you, that you're going to fulfill the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, of smiling to people, even though it might seem strange. To, to people, not to you. There's nothing strange about the Sunnah of the Prophet. It's strange because people are so, they've been so long without it. You know. But to brighten up someone's day, I'm going out now. And then what that becomes, it becomes fi sabilillah, you're in the path of Allah. As opposed to just having this thing where you're just trying to bide the time. You're acknowledging the time, embracing the time, and becoming really creative with a whole load of different intentions. Now what's interesting is, as we said, that the heart is the place where intentions are cradled. Ultimately, one of the things that the scholars will say, the likes of Habib Ahmed bin Hassan al-Attas, is the reality of an intention is it's something which is given to you. You think that you're thinking of this, but if a person, all you can do is make sure your heart is in a subtle, su uh, is in a uh, supple state, ready to receive those intentions. So to turn to Allah, to pray to Allah, to be a person of dhikr. And the more a person does this and reorientates themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what starts to happen is they'll be taught intentions. You'll start to become more creative. And this is from a similar thing as when people talk about you just had a creative flow or I had a certain opening in something that I did. You know, things were just working and clicked together. When a person actively says, now I'm going to spend some time and reflect upon my intentions, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reciprocates and the heart starts to become very creative in thinking of all these intentions. Now what's really happening is Allah is giving your intentions and they say this is one of the signs of the people of Allah is that they don't do anything except it's with an intention. It's almost Allah will not waste their time. They never do anything except it's 
uh, it coincides with a multitude of intentions. So this is why you can't say I'm wasting this person's time. Like you could never waste the Prophet's time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His time was guarded by Allah. And even if you were wasting his time, you weren't. You were wasting your time because he was filled with these intentions and he'll, he would have been recorded, uh, rewarded thus. The same with the people of Allah. So a lot of the time, even if we're involved in trivia, it's what it's doing is clearing these things away. Saying, Allah, I'm here and I'm thinking of you and I'm doing this for you and I'm saying this for you. So there's a component of intention making which can sound almost kind of staged and almost kind of contrived. But what this does, it's like anything. When a person trains for anything, there are certain kind of banal, slightly boring stages that you have to go through. But were you not to go through those stages and those formalities, then it wouldn't allow you to do certain things. I'll give you an example. If someone's training in the gym, it's a good example because there are many analogies to that. The monotony of going to the gym is not that Im impressive. But what it does do is it has a certain effect on your cardio, on your strength, that may be of use in a time which is really meaningful. You may put that strength to good use. And this, this practice of cultivating intentions does this. That you'll be put in a situation, what can I do right now? But because you've, you've trained that part of you, you become very quick at making this uh, seemingly you know, dull lead, of a moment of dull lead, into a moment of spiritual gold, something of value to Allah, something of meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, if your journals aren't completely full, this is one of the, other, the, the recommendations that we have uh, whether it's in the same journal, don't get the things mixed up because you might think you're going into muraqaba and muhasaba and, and your intentions. And, but have a page where each day you comb through just the, even the boring stuff. How am, I'm going to go through my day. What do I normally do on a typical day? And you can get more and more refined. We jump straight to uh, going in the car to work. There's a whole host of things before that. What's it? Do you guys have breakfast in the morning? Do Swedes have breakfast? What is it? Some? Uh, porridge. Definitely. So you can get rewarded by Allah. You can come close to Allah for, for eating a bowl of porridge. Zubair would be pleased to know. Or doing whatever you do. This is one of the, the specific examples that we're all involved in. We've all got to eat and drink. But it's mubah. Like, if you don't eat and drink, you're not in sin unless it leads to you know, starving oneself. But if you skip a meal, there's no sin in that. If you eat food, it's halal and it's good. There's no inherent reward for doing that. So Imam al-Haddad says that to make use out of this. And he says to one of the most important intentions to make is to gain strength. In, the, in devotion to Allah. Because what, what can happen sometimes if people you get too hungry, you get groggy, and you get like your, your character goes down. But if you, okay, I'm going to eat this as a sign of my weakness before Allah, like that we need to eat in order to maintain good character. It's like when people get fast, start fasting, all of a sudden they become like deeply self reflective and like, you know, easy to point out that's not Sunnah, brother, and that's not. The, they become very like groggy, but it's nafs. It's, it's nafs. It's just the fact that your glucose levels are dropped and you feel a bit taban. You just feel worn out. Uh, you know. So to make those intentions. And they do this uh, even with the young children, uh, kind of kindergarten level, so in, in, in traditional cultures. So when my children went to, when they go to, kin when they went to kindergarten, they teach them before they eat, you recite the prophetic dua. Allahumma barik lana fi ma razaqtana wa razaqna khayra minhu And then they say Waj'anhu awnan lana ala ta'ati Allahi wa rasoolih Bismillah They do like a little 
jingle so the kids can memorize it. وَجَعَلْهُ عَوْنًا لَنَا And make it an assistance for us in the, in the obedience to Allah and His Prophet you know, It's a really beautiful thing And the kids kind of do remind you like if you forget But it, what that does is it, is it makes that meal so much more meaningful You know we discussed recently about how the Prophet وسلم, Wouldn't like overly praise food and talk you know wow this because it's connecting the nafs But he would see the blessing in the food and that's what would be that's what he would enjoy in, and engage in and it's, a, and it's a way of infusing blessing into the food so on and so forth I just wanted to read and go through a few things on the intention So it's important to understand that when the Prophet towards the, uh, as the hadith continues, he talks about the hijra as an ex- by means of example. For man kana hijratuhu ilallahi wa rasulih, for hijratuhu ilallahi wa rasulih. When man kana hijratuhu li dunya, yusibuha a wimra atin yankihuha, for hijratuhu ila ma hajra ilayh. That the one whose hijrah, whose migration is to Allah and his Prophet وسلم, For his hijrah, his migration is indeed to Allah and his Prophet But for the one whose hijrah, there's a difference Outwardly his migration, going from Mecca to Medina He's doing the outward act But it's not for Allah and his Prophet Lidunya yusibuha It's for the world Some kind of attaining of the world or you could say, I don't know, how do you make, make that sound real to people? You know, going to a religious gathering to look for a spouse. I'm seeking sacred knowledge. Allahu Alam. You know, that's an example. Because the Prophet وسلم, says this, or to, to propose to a woman. Because he was talking about someone in particular here, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a man that was engaged to a lady in Medina, and he went on the hijrah, and it's kind of like, what's your intention? Like, why are you? Don't lose out on the reward, because the reward for the for the hijrah was huge. For hijrah to who? hajra ilay. So the reality of his hijrah, of this outward act, is in accordance to his intentions. Like you, you get that which the, the reason why you migrated. And then Imam al-Haddad, he says, قال سيدنا Imam Abdullah ibn Ali al-Haddad رضي الله عنه خص الهجرة عليه الصلاة والسلام من بين سائر الأعمال تنبيها على الكل بالبعض لأن المعلوم عند أول الأفهام أن الأخبار إخبار ليس خاصة بالهجرة بل هو عام في جميع الشراء الإسلام انتهى So he's saying that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم focused in on, on the hijra by means of analogy and almost an encouragement to his ummah to say, by this, by means of analogy, apply it to everything that you do. Where, why are you going to where you're going to? Why are you engaged in what you're engaged in? Why are you saying what you're saying? And one of the first things that we'll do, when you start monitoring, because it's to do with muraqaba and muhasaba, what's the intention behind it? And this is also a different phase in muhasaba. Muhasaba to niyat, that you literally account your intentions. You know, so it's no longer, as we said, there are degrees. It's no longer, why did I do what I did? At the end of the day, you did something. It's no longer just, why did I do what I did? Or, I did something, and it was not the best thing to do. Now you're looking deeper. Why did I do what I did? It's getting deeper into the roots. And the more present a person becomes with these uh, processes within the soul, the more able you, you are to apprehend them. Now they say uh, in fiqh, qastu shay muqtarin bi fi'lih. It has to coincide with the act. So, like in the, in the prayer, uh, the intention comes in with the takbir, with the wudu, with the washing of the face within the, in the madhab of Imam al Shafi'i. However, in general, the scholars have a difference of opinion. Outside of the realms of fiqh, just how we worship and so on and so forth. So you can have an intention way prior 
to the actual act. You know, I intend that one day I'm going to do this. I intend that someday I'm going to, you know, memorize the Quran. I intend I'm going to. It has to be real, but you have to like start acquainting the heart with these things. Or you can do it when it coincides with the act. Now that's typically more in mundane, everyday things. So you become a lot more conscious about why am I saying what I'm saying? Is it to show off? Is it for status? Is it to be, to be impressive? Is it to sound like you know, something that I'm not? What's the reason that I'm saying what I'm saying? Why? And wh one of the first things that that will do is make you a very quiet person. Because you'll become much more aware and reflective of what you're saying. And Imam al-Haddad says that you should not speak anything and this is, we're talking about a, a spiritual station now. It's not an easy thing to do. You should not say anything except that you can see a tangible reward in doing so. Now people say, well, how does that? It doesn't mean people become all awkward. This happens sometimes when people like start approaching the deen. They become all like stiff and awkward and inorganic in their kind of mode of being. And the Prophet ﷺ was not like this. So what we're saying is, even seeming trivia, as we know, like if a person speaks with their spouse, in trivia, they're not taken into account for it. Why? Because that's part of marital life. Like if you, everything is going to be like super serious and intense all the time, it doesn't ease the flow of, of, of you know, that connection. But even though it's outwardly trivia, it's rooted in something meaningful because it's rooted in that connection and making people feel at ease. Sometimes, if you meet someone, you know, and you're just thinking, you know, how do I say something that I'm earning reward from Allah and it's, you're only going to speak in Quran, you're only going to, the person is going to be like, this guy's weird, this person is just strange. You know, so, be normal. The Prophet ﷺ, like easy going. And he said, he said, that's the way the believer should be. And mu'min hayyinun layin. But that's the difference. In your ease and mode of being, it's rooted deeply. Like that you care for this person. That you want them to connect to Allah. That you have a love for them. That Allah raises them and blesses them and fills them with light. And that's your, the default of your interaction. That's the default of your meeting. It's not just being there, hi, yeah, I'm okay. I'm all right. And you don't... Even the words that you say now become like t full of tashetut, they be become like fragmented. You know? So when you meet someone, to really be actively think about what you're going to do. Because it's not, from, it's not from you. You're not the one, who am I to guide anyone to Allah, to be a, absolutely no one, like everyone else. But Allah works through people. And if you come laden with intentions and a goodness towards people, it spills out and it elevates people and it raises people. I wanted to read something. It was actually sent to me this morning and I thought it was really beautiful because I think it kind of This is uh, it's a translation. I asked about like the, the the source of it, but it's it's a translation of one of the the teachers of our teachers, Habib Abdul Qadir al-Saggaf. So they've entitled it "The Rays of the Soul," and I want you to think about this in the context of what we've been speaking about: you know, having a heart which is intention, intentional, intending Allah. Because you're not intending, you know, I, I intend that this person has a good day. Why? Because it's dear to Allah. And that's why the first intention should always be to, to seek the good pleasure of Allah. Like it's not just random goodness, niceness to be nice people. <coughs> Everything has to be rooted, and that's what I mean by rooted, in Allah. Rooted back to Allah. That's where the light will come from. And that's where the, you know, the, the, that flood of intention will come. So he's talking about these people that have really taken this seriously and applied it, they've understood it and they've applied it. He says, every person has rays which emanate from their soul. You receive these rays when you come close to them or sit in their presence. 
each person's rays differ in strength according to the state of their soul. This explains how you become affected by sitting in the presence of great people. They are people who follow the way of the prophets in their religious and worldly affairs. When they speak, they counsel people in a beautiful way. Their actions alone guide people. When they are silent, they are like signposts which guide people along the path or like lighthouses whose rays guide ships. Many of them speak very little. But when you see them or visit them, you are affected by them. You leave their gatherings having been enveloped in their tranquility. Their silence has more effect than the eloquent speech of others. This is because the rays of their souls enter you. Have you ever been in a, a bad state, like a bad vibe, and, you've, and you know everyone else is feeling it? And you're kind of subconsciously aware that, uh, I'm, I know they can see that I'm not in the best state right now. You know, but you're not bothered because you're grumpy and moody anyway. You know. But look how people, even if you try and put on a nice face, you can tell that their souls are being affected. They feel uncomfortable or awkward. There's not that flow. That's the same thing happening. Now imagine if we engage in this practice of intentionality, being aware of why we're doing what we're doing, and cultivating that space of why, the transformative effect that that has on the soul. Because then all you do is project that which you're connected back to, that which you're rooted in, and it's that which guides people. Why did he say there's people that speak very little? Because their conversation really ultimately is with Allah. And that's one of the languages in which you converse with Allah in, the language of the heart, the language of intentionality. You know, it's, it's a lot, and you have to be real because you know Allah sees your heart. And that's why it's, it's so empowering because sometimes it's like, I'm not really actually even intending that. Okay, maybe I need to cut this out of my life. Or maybe I need to like work a bit harder in why I'm doing what I'm doing. If we don't have this, what, what can happen very easily is it leads to spiritual burnout. Because you've taken on all of these practices, doing all these things, but it's not rooted and connected. And for the same reason, this is why when we see the people of Allah and they just keep on going, they're non-stop. If anything, they're just on the increase and there's no sign of nasab, no sign of like tab, no sign of exhaustion because they're rooted and connected back. They're always connected. So the Prophet وسلم, part of, we've reflected on this a few times, and he was never seen except he was coming or going. He was always turning to Allah. He was always facing Allah. And one of Sallallahu Alaihi and one of the, the definitions of this very science is to learn how to have a face towards creation and a face towards God. And to know ultimately that it's, they're not in opposite directions. You just need to know this adab of how to be. You know. And this has a huge effect has a huge effect. There's so many people, they feel like unempowered in their lives, lacking purpose. You know, many people, they feel unworthy, unfulfilled in their work, in their relationships, you know, even in their deen. And, and what this can do is really because don't think it's one way. Don't think it's you. You're you're really striving to go back to Allah, and He's just watching on. Like who initiated that within you? That want, that drive, and don't think it's not going to be. There's no response. 
And the response from Allah is also to the heart. And you'll see it open up in your day. Because Allah is move, moving. He, create, he can move the mountains. You don't think He can move certain situational things in your day that, that you know, redirect you to a different experience in life? The signs are all there. But when we're closed up and we, we, we don't communicate with Allah, that's what it's ultimately about. We don't, we're losing the capacity to talk. Everyone knew that language. Children are really amazing to watch because they find it very easy to understand these things. But as adults, we've like learned how not to communicate. How, you know, this word communion, to be in communion with Allah. Just the, the, the art of making du'a. We need to have you know, reflections on just how to make du'a. How do you make du'a? As a Muslim, do I really know how to pray? How to call on Allah? Because the prophets, they were always in that state. They were always asking Allah. Even when they were speaking to people, they were always, you know. Habib Umar said, he said, if, you, if you're calling someone like, to Islam, calling someone back to Allah, and the outward just, you know, locks up before you, like they're just like, no, I'm not interested. The da'wah never stops. Why? Because the reality of that call was ultimately an intention and a care and a concern in your heart. And just, now you're speaking about the football. You're not speaking about God. <clears throat> or you're speaking about whatever. Something trivial, but your, your, your heart is there, like hurting and paining for that person. You know, I think when the Prophet was smiling with the Sahaba, all he wanted for them is just to be with Allah. Everything he did, there was, that's why there was nothing mundane about what he did. Everything he did was a signpost. When he was still, when he was moving, when he was amongst people. You know, subtle things. You know, and that's why I never underestimate the people of this, this, this way. Like when they give you something, or when they give you advice, and it, it may not seem profound, but you need to like be attentive to what they're saying, because it it's, it's comes from a place of consciousness, comes from a place of clarity, comes from a place of meaning and intention. It's not just they're not working on the same plane that we're working on, this mundane type, you know, just floating through existence. They're active. They're seeking Allah in everything that they do and don't do and say and don't say. That's why being around them, you feel connected, because they're connected. And connection, that's what it's all about. You know? So may Allah allow us to rediscover that language. To learn a language, you have to go through the, you know, the boring rules. You have to go through the grammar, you have to go through, you have to learn. It sometimes feels almost kind of cumbersome and not very inspiring. But what's amazing is when you learn a new language, and you get to a particular stage where you actually can say something and somebody responds to you and you understand it. It's one of the most fulfilling things a person can do. Wow, like I'm starting to get this now. It's starting to make sense. Imagine if the one you're speaking to is Rabbil Alameen. How's that going to feel? To know when he's looking out for you, to know when he was the one that gave you that little thing that nobody else noticed. And that's what this is all about, turning back to Allah. You know, doing things for the sake of Allah. So, what uh, our teachers would recommend as a practical advice is that if there's any major decision you have to make in your life or anything you're embarking upon, then to sit down and write intentions. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I embarking upon what I'm embark embarking upon? And this can be even things like going to a new job, you know, changing school, you know, going through a particular, to a particular path in your life. And this is really important for the, to look at those things, not just, you know, going, on, going to, to work in the car, but think, like being a father, being a mother. What are my intentions for being a father? What are my intentions for being a mother? What are my intentions for being a husband? What are my intentions for being a wife? What are my intentions for being a friend? What are my intentions for visiting this person? You know. And this is, as with everything in this science, it's a process. 
And if, if we apply it, and if we do these things on a daily level, you know, when I wake up in the morning, just to, to be intentional, things will start to change within the heart and you'll be able to, to lift more weight. You'll be able to carry more. You'll be more agile in this process. To the point they say some of the olia, they don't enter into the prayer except they have 70,000 intentions flooding into their heart. It doesn't even make sense to us. How can you even do that? It's because this whole thing is like condensed, like the big bang of, you know. And that's what they do. That's why they're, it's so potent to be around them because they're just emanating these rays of goodness because it's rooted in what's real. You know? What it also does is a great... Um, way to see like if you're actually being real or fake because you, if you just said something you say was that really for the sake of Allah first and foremost it has to be can't be haram or makruh if it was and it's not for the sake of Allah <coughs> you see you know you can it's not a pleasant analogy but it, it runs home you can scrub a pig in soap but it doesn't make it clean you know So you've got to make good intentions, and many intentions. Part of the nature of the intention is it's timeless. So you said you can make it before, during, and some of the muhaqqiqeen, some of the masters of this science, said you can even make it after the act because of the grace of Allah. Just the, if you do something and you thought, you know, that was just an empty act. <clears throat> and they say, you know what, I should have done it for this reason, this, and Allah, because of His grace, will reward you. you know? So like, it's like making things up, and it also should be part of a muhasaba process as well, like, ah, that wasn't really active in my intention for that. Why did I go out today? Why did I do what I did? Why did I? You know? so for example, many, many Muslims, mashallah, you go out and they, you know, people are fighting to pay the bill. That's a beautiful thing, sort of, you know, hospitality, or they're inviting people into their homes. Now, generally, we know it's a nice thing to do. Why am I doing this? Why am I cooking the food? But not just to be the, you know, worrying about whether the samosas are overcooked or whatever, but to think, be active, make dhikr, and make loads of intentions that people are really benefited from this food. You know? And not just the people that are eating, that Allah benefits the entire ummah for this one samosa that I'm making right now, whatever it may be. So something so seemingly trivial can be so profound. You know, sometimes it's really hard, like, you know, waking up in the night, like mothers, subhanAllah, amazing. Like waking up to tend to like a young baby, it's so difficult on the nafs. And it can be really difficult and, and, and kind of, you can burn out. What's the point? But if you do this, to, and you can make intentions like to take care and to nurture a child from the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu And this is what's been given to me now. and. Through this, may Allah take care of all of the children of the Ummah and have someone to cradle them at night. There's so many things that you can think of like this and be intentional in this way. So, inshallah, there's, there's so much to do, uh, so many examples of this. It would be great to kind of hear, maybe next session, if people have any examples of, uh, of intentions that they've made for certain things. Maybe they, if they want to post it, you know, message it if they feel shy to mention it. But this is really important, and you'll feel it transform your day. There's no such thing as a mundane day in the life of a Muslim. Like, you, you, you're connected to Allah, how could it be mundane? It's everything. And don't, don't think, like, the Ummah was built upon this, really. It wasn't the great sieges and the people, it was built upon these realities. You know, it was built upon the Prophet, calling, you know, some guy and say, look, don't go to Medina for this reason, go for that reason, because uh, you're going to lose out. And it has an effect. We talked a lot about <clears throat> how this has an effect on other people around us. If all you do is cultivate your heart and be a person of good intentions and do it for the sake of Allah, ikhlas, that's the reason to change things. You know, you don't have to overthink things. Well, the political situation right now, great, you know, analyze it to death, comment on it to death. But nothing is going to change until you change that which is in yourself. Indeed, Allah won't change ma bi qawmin, that which is with the people, the nature of a people. Hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim, until they change that which is in their nafs, in, in their egos, anfusihim. 
So change it for that which is meaningless and mundane and, and change it, orient it back to Allah. He's waiting. You know? And don't wait, like right now. Right now. Think about how to change, what you can make an intention for. And if people came here without intentions, make intentions. You know the intention for attending a gathering of sacred knowledge? It's huge. It could be the means of going to Jannah. And when you go back home, to convey that knowledge, to be that knowledge, not just to the people waiting at, at home and then you're like a shaitan to every person you pass on the street. <laughs> you, know. you carry it with you and you become that person. And if it's truly real, khalas, you're going to become nebawi. You're going to become prophetic in your entire being. People are going to see it. You know. People are going to feel safe. You know. So may Allah make us of these people, inshallah, and connect us to these people. That's what it's all about, really. It's all about connections. It's not about fluffy sayings, nice, eloquent concepts. It's about connection, really. And where we end up for eternity is really to do with what we're connected to whilst here in this world. Who are you connected to? What are you connected to? What are you interested in? What are you inclining towards? You know, may Allah connect us to the people who are connected. في خير ولطف وعافية وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, question of the clarification of the word mundane. You give some synonyms for mundane. Yeah. Mundane, normally it's that which is uninspired. And inspiration traditionally meant that which came from God. So it's just something which you're kind of, uh, you know, an act which has no intention. It's mundane, it's trivial, it has no meaning behind it, uh, it has no purpose, it has no intention behind it. You know, so a mundane act, you could say, is, is a mubah act. There's, it's neither here nor there. Why are you sat there watching TV? Mm. Don't know. It's a mundane act. It's not, meaning, it's not meaningful. You know? And often the time people think, well, my life, I'm not in a place where I can go out and change the world. So you feel, especially it happens with young people, like, feel just impotent. I can't do anything. But you can. You can engage with yourself. And that is changing the world. <coughs> you know? That saying attributed to one of the great masters, you know, yesterday I was clever, so I decided to change, so I wanted to change the world. Clever, like a clever clogs. Like I get everything. You know, yesterday when I was young, I wanted to change the I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. But now I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. And the understanding of that is if we're truly working on ourselves, you will change the world. Whether you know it or not, you're changing the world as you're changing yourself. You know, so that which is mundane, that which is trivial, that which has no purpose, that which is meaningless, you know. And a lot of those things, they seem outwardly meaningless. You know, why am I going to, I've got a dead end job. A lot of Muslims, you hear them talk like, you know, I want to have a job that's fulfilling. The world is just, you know, earning a living sometimes is not that romantic, not that glamorous. As long as you're doing it in halal, it doesn't matter. It's your intention behind it. You know, and so much of the Ummah was filled with people like, like in grocery shops or like selling vegetables or selling meat or selling like, there's nothing like, you know, vastly transformative within the social spheres. It doesn't mean you have to be like, you know, whatever it may be, like someone that outwardly seems like they're changing things. You do what you have to do to that which Allah facilitates for you. But how many of those people in that state, by virtue of their intention, that which was seemingly mundane, all you're doing is buying and selling. That's what the Prophet ﷺ did. And for that reason, they actually say it's the greatest profession, <coughs> trade, tijara. There's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Some of them say it's in farming. Zira Imam al Nawi said it was in farming. But the dominant position is the greatest profession anyone could have is in trade, just buying and selling. And that's why they say also, even if that's not your day job, to always have some kind of trade. Even if it's just, I don't know, whatever, something small. Because there's barakah in trade, because it's what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. You know. Now, what was he trading in, وسلم, even when he went on those early expeditions to, to Sham? It wasn't, you know, 
religious texts of, about Islam, it was before the revelation. You know, but there was, you know, many of the great scholars were tradesmen. You know, they'd selling, sell cloth and they'd sell like... But what were their intentions behind that? And that's what made it profound. That's what transformed it to being, from being mundane to being profound. Profound is that which is accepted by Allah. That which is meaningful to Allah. You know, Actions are rooted in their intentions. Every person gets that which they intended. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair.